The power of synthesizers lies in their ability to create a huge range of sounds. Unlike traditional instruments, which are limited to a specific range of notes, types of expression, and tone color, synthesizers offer almost limitless sonic possibilities. They can mimic the sounds of acoustic instruments, yet also venture into uncharted territory, generating sounds not found in nature. This versatility stems from the synthesizer's unique ability to manipulate sound at its very source. By modifying electronic signals, composers and musicians can shape sound waves, controlling their pitch, tone color, and duration. This allows for the creation of complex soundscapes, from warm, organic textures to harsh, industrial tones. The synthesizer's influence extends far beyond its sound-generating capabilities. This instrument has fundamentally changed the way we interact with music, both as creators and listeners. Its arrival ushered in an era of experimentation and innovation, pushing the boundaries of what was considered musical. This spirit of exploration continues today, as synthesizers have become more accessible and user-friendly. Software synthesizers and plugins have democratized music production, allowing anyone with a computer to explore the world of electronic music creation. The barriers to entry are lower than ever before, fueling a new wave of creativity and sonic exploration. As I began to organize the materials to create this film during this intense week, it quickly became clear that it would not be possible to do it in such a short time in the form of one long film. In order not to compromise the quality of the content presented or to omit something important, I decided to divide the work into three parts. The first part, which as you can see is quite large, I present to you today. The next two will appear in the next two Saturdays. Then I will make one long film out of it, which will also be available to watch as a whole. By the way, I am open to your requests or suggestions. Please let me know in the comments. The creation of synthesizers was made possible by the invention of the transistor, for which John Bardeen, Walter Hauser Brattain and William Bradford Shockley received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. The first synthesizers were created in the early 1960s by American designers and inventors Don Buchler and Robert Moog. Robert Moog began creating his first synthesizer in 1963 when he met at the conference Herbert Deutsch, a composer, teacher and inventor with similar interests. Robert, with his help, designed the first Moog synthesizer. They were encouraged to do so by Myron Hoffman of the University of Toronto. A year later, Robert was invited to the Audio Engineering Society convention, where he received his first order immediately after the presentation, from Alvin Nicolais, an American choreographer and composer. This new modular instrument unexpectedly quickly became synonymous with electronic music. Unlike earlier, often bulky and difficult to use electronic instruments, the MOOC synthesizer offered musicians a relatively intuitive way to control and manipulate sound. Key to the Moog synthesizer's versatility was its modular design. Each module was assigned to a specific function, such as oscillators, filters and amplifiers. They could be connected together using patch cables. However, what really set Moog's invention apart was its ability to integrate different elements using control voltage, which allowed musicians to precisely control sound parameters in real time. At the same time, it was a practical solution at a time when electronic circuits were still relatively expensive. Moog designed a set of modules for generating and modifying signals, as well as controlling parameters that could be easily interconnected to control the functions and sounds of other elements of the system. The main part of the synthesizer was the voltage-controlled oscillator, VCO, 
which produce the basic audio signal in various waveforms, such as sawtooth, square, and sine. This signal could then be transformed by other modules, such as voltage-controlled amplifiers, VCAs, filters, VCFs, envelope generators, and ring modulators. An important addition to the synthesizer was also the sequencer, which allowed the creation of repeating patterns of sounds without the use of a keyboard, generating voltages step by step at program time intervals. A sequencer is a kind of automaton that plays a specific sequence of sounds in a programmed way. All the modules of the instrument could be connected using patch cables with quarter-inch jacks, exactly the same as in old telephone exchanges, hence their name, and the knobs and switches on each module allowed the modification of sounds and effects. All this allowed musicians to create complex sound chains and explore a vast array of sonic possibilities, and modularity gave the Moog synthesizer an almost unlimited ability to create sound by combining different modules in different configurations, musicians could shape and mold sound waves with unprecedented control, creating everything from warm, analog tones to unearthly electronic textures. Robert Moog's synthesizer was presented to the general public at the Monterey International Pop Festival in 1967. The commercial breakthrough came just a year later. Wendy Carlos, then still called Walter Carlos, recorded a groundbreaking album, Switched on Bach. This record contained reworkings of themes by Johann Sebastian Bach, played on Moog synthesizers. Wendy, as Robert's assistant, made a significant contribution to the development of synthesizers. She was also the first famous performer of electronic music, and her record became not only the best-selling classical music album of the time, but also one of the best-selling electronic music albums of all time. The album won three Grammy Awards. It is worth adding that Wendy Carlos later composed the music for Stanley Kubrick's films A Clockwork Orange and The Shining and in 1982, for Steven Lisberger's film, Tron, known to probably every fan of science fiction and computers. Not knowing this film results in failing the hacker test. It is also worth mentioning that Wendy was one of the first famous people to draw public attention to the problems of transgender people. Wendy Carlos collaborated with Robert Moog in the years 1967-1968 helping him to improve synthesizers. Using the new instrument, other works quickly began to emerge, especially during the so-called Summer of Love, for example, the single Reflections, Diana Ross and the Supremes, the album Strange Days, The Doors, the album Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn and Jones, Limited, by the group The Monkees, the album Their Satanic Majesty's Request, the Rolling Stones. The impact of this synthesizer on popular music was almost immediate and profound. Its characteristic sound, distinguished by rich, warm tones and characteristic expression, immediately captured the imagination of musicians and listeners alike. Moog synthesizers could also be heard on hit records such as Abbey Road by The Beatles or Bookends by Simon and Garfunkel, the band Emerson, Lake and Palmer, thanks to keyboardist Keith Emerson, used MOOC synthesizers very intensively. While Robert Moog focused on creating synthesizers that could be used in traditional musical compositions, Don Buchla took a different path. He was a pioneer in developing instruments that were not only meant to sound different, but also to change the way music was created and perceived. In 1963, in connection with an order for a new type of instrument from the San Francisco Tape Music Center, Don Buchla met with visionary musicians and artists, such as Morton Subotnik and Ramon Sender, 
who were looking for new sonic possibilities for their compositions. Their needs became the inspiration for creating something that would forever change music. His Bukla Series 100 synthesizer, also known as the Bukla Box, was far more experimental than the Moog instrument. Bukla eschewed traditional interfaces, such as the piano keyboard, preferring instead touch panels and sliders and other unconventional ways of controlling sound. As a result, his instruments were used by artists creating avant-garde and experimental music. The device allowed for incredible flexibility. It consisted of various modules, oscillators, filters, envelope generators that could be interconnected in various ways to create sounds of unprecedented complexity. The modules were connected by patch cables, which allowed artists to directly control the sound, creating their own unique signal paths. This modular approach, where each element could be changed and customized, opened the door to experimenting with electronic music on an unprecedented scale. One of the first artists to use Bachla's instrument was Morton Subotnik. His album, Silver Apples of the Moon, released in 1967, was one of the first compositions created entirely using a synthesizer. This work became a milestone in the history of electronic music. Thanks to Bushla's synthesizer, Subotnik was able to create sounds that were completely detached from traditional tones and rhythms. He could create smooth transitions between sounds, manipulate them in real time, which enabled artistic expression on a previously unattainable level. It is worth noting that Bukla designed his devices with composers of experimental and academic music in mind, which distinguished him from Robert Moog, who sought to meet the needs of musicians from more popular musical genres. Instead of imitating the sounds of traditional instruments, Buchla's synthesizers opened the door to creating new abstract sounds that could be used in electronic music, film, and even various types of art installations. One of the characteristic elements of the Buchla synthesizer was the unique touch keyboard, which Buchla called the multi-touch capacitance sensitive keyboard. Instead of a mechanical keyboard like a piano, which would limit the possibilities of sound modulation, this keyboard allowed for smooth changes in sound parameters depending on the force and location of the touch. It was a step towards a more intuitive, bodily, sensory approach to creating electronic music, which engaged the artist physically and emotionally. Over the years, Bukla continued to develop his synthesizers, creating further innovative devices, such as the Bukla Series 200 and Bukla Series 300, which integrated digital computer technology with analog sound modulation capabilities. His synthesizers became an inspiration for a whole generation of composers and experimental musicians. However, the Bukla synthesizer was not only a tool for experimentation, it became a symbol of a revolution in music, a symbol of the search for new sounds that could express emotions and ideas unattainable using traditional instruments. Its contribution to electronic music is invaluable. Without Bukla, much of what we perceive as the norm in electronic music today might never have come to be. Today, Bukla synthesizers are considered rare and valuable instruments, and their original versions fetch high prices on the collector's market. However, their influence on contemporary electronic music continues to this day. In the age of VSTs, digital synthesizers and DAVU software, the spirit of Don Bukla's innovation still inspires musicians around the world to push the boundaries of sound and music. The inventions of Robert Moog and Don Bukla created two main philosophies of sound synthesis that have shaped the development of electronic music since the 1960s, East Coast and West Coast synthesis. The names 
East Coast and West Coast synthesis come from the locations of the inventors who developed these synthesis systems. On the East Coast of the United States, Robert Moog was a pioneer of what is known as subtractive synthesis. It was his synthesizers, the Moog modular, that became the foundation of what we now call East Coast synthesis. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, in California, Don Buchla was working on a completely different approach to creating sounds. His instruments expressed the spirit of experimental avant-garde music, and Buchla designed them for musicians looking for new, unconventional forms of expression. East Coast philosophy, simplicity and control. Let's start with East Coast synthesis. The most recognizable example of this technology are Moog synthesizers, which have a fairly simple structure compared to their Western counterpart. The main principle of East Coast is subtractive synthesis, a technique of generating sound using oscillators that create harmonically rich sound waves, such as sawtooth or square waves, and then filtering to remove unwanted frequencies. So in MOOC systems, we will find oscillators, low-pass filters, ADSR envelopes, i.e. attack, decay, sustain, release, and amplifiers. The whole philosophy of East Coast is based on the classical concepts of tonality and harmony. The goal is to create music that easily interacts with traditional instruments. Examples of use include film music, progressive rock, and various genres of pop music. West Coast philosophy, experiments and innovations. Now let's move on to West Coast synthesis, which has completely different assumptions. Don Buchla deliberately avoided traditional elements, such as the keyboard, considering it a limitation to creativity. In Buchla synthesizers, you won't find a classic keyboard. Instead, there are touchpads and other innovative interfaces for controlling sound. West Coast synthesis mainly uses techniques such as additive synthesis and frequency modulation, allowing you to create more abstract, non-melodic sounds. Butler systems also often offer what we call cyclic controllers, which allow you to generate rhythmic, repeating sequences. West Coast users are more likely to experiment with unusual sound textures which is why these synthesizers were popular in experimental and avant-garde music. Similarities and differences. Although both philosophies aim to create new sounds, they differ in how they are generated and controlled. East Coast is more focused on tonal music, classical melodies and harmonies, while West Coast opens up space for abstract, often non-melodic sound structures. One of the key similarities is, of course, the use of oscillators, which are at the heart of both systems. However, the approach to using them is different. East Coast oscillators are filtered and shaped to create clean and predictable sounds, while West Coast allows for more dynamic, sometimes chaotic modulations. In East Coast, filters are key, which sculpt the sound in West Coast. Modulators that create completely new sounds East Coast and West Coast synthesis are two different philosophies that represent not only two geographic areas, but also different approaches to music. Robert Moog focused on simplification, control, and traditional melodies, while Don Buchla explored more experimental and abstract soundscapes. Today, both Moog and Buchla synthesizers remain key tools in the arsenal of contemporary musicians. Although these approaches often differ in the way they work, both schools have had a huge impact on the development of electronic music and have shaped the sound of many musical genres. Time for the story of the first synthesizer hit, a pop hit, and one that has the word pop in its title. You all probably already guessed that it's Popcorn, one of the most famous and influential tracks in the history of electronic music. Gershon Kingsley was one of the first musicians to experiment with synthesizers in the 1960s. In 1969, while creating the album Music to Move By, 
he decided to fully exploit the potential of the new instrument, the MOOC synthesizer, which revolutionized the sound and way of making music. Popcorn was a simple rhythmic composition with a repetitive, catchy melody that didn't immediately win over listeners. Although Kingsley's original version was not a mass success, three years later, the track gained international popularity thanks to the group Hot Butter, led by Stanley Freeberg. Hot Butter's version was more dynamic, with a modern sound, and its rhythmic, electronic pulse hit the tastes of listeners around the world. It was this version of Popcorn that became a hit, topping the charts in many countries, including France, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, and also in the United States. The success of Popcorn contributed to the popularization of electronic music and showed that synthesizers can be not only experimental instruments, but also a tool for creating hits. The track is considered one of the first synth pop hits that influenced the development of genres such as disco, new wave, and synth pop in the 1970s and 1980s. In the following years, Popcorn was treated to many remakes and covers. One of the last thanks to Crazy Frog is known even to the youngest listeners, and its influence is felt to this day in various musical genres. It has also become a symbol of the era when electronics began to penetrate popular music. With its catchy and easily recognizable melody, the track Popcorn has become a part of pop culture. It has been used in commercials, TV shows, and movies. Moreover, its simple structure meant that it was often used as a backing track for various technical demonstrations of the capabilities of synthesizers at the time. Popcorn remains one of the most recognizable pieces of electronic music today, and its timeless nature means that it still appears in new arrangements and interpretations, reminding us of the beginnings of the synthesizer era. The pioneering era of synthesizers lasted until about the mid-1970s. Then synthesizers became increasingly common in all genres of music. Other companies such as RP, Korg, Roland and Yamaha began producing synthesizers. Synthesizers entered pop music, creating new subgenres within it and helping to create prog rock. We will enter this perhaps most interesting phase in the development of synthesizers and electronic music in the next episode of the film. In the meantime, I ask for your comments with your ratings, ideas and suggestions. Please also subscribe to my channel and give me a thumbs up. Every comment also helps to gain popularity, which is not easy. Thank you all very much. Let the synthesizers ring on.